Origins 9, Marriage, a Gift from Eden. We've been studying the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter of 2013. Uh, the principal contributor is a, the uh, current uh, uh, director. director of the uh, Geoscience uh, Research Institute, Dr. James Gibson. I think he's performing a valuable service. The editor is Clifford Goldstein, who's uh, pretty, uh, I think, quite pleased with the, uh, the lessons as well. There are a lot of other people that have been helping. And uh, we've already gone through eight lessons, including Jesus, Provider, and Sustainer last week, which uh, I think is an interesting lesson. Now we're coming to Marriage, a Gift from Eden. We have four more to go after this. The environment, Sabbath, the gospel, and recreation. Our memory text is Genesis 2.18. Um, and uh, I hope that you, some of you at least memorized it. How many <laughs> know it? This time they gave it in the Old King. So I actually know it this time. It is not good. The Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And of course, the uh, discussion of helpmeet uh, raises very interesting questions. Uh, the lessons take on it is um, think of the blessings of a happy marriage in a loving home. How fortunate are those who have such an experience. Unfortunately, for too many people, marriage has been an experience of mostly pain and anger rather than of joy and peace. This is not how it was intended or how it should be. The sad state of so many marriages is a powerful expression of the degradation that sin has brought to the human race. God celebrated the first marriage. Thus, the institution has for its originator the creator of the universe. Marriage is honorable, and I might finish the rest of that text, and the bed undefiled which means there's nothing wrong with sex, at least in the proper uh, circumstances. It was one of the first gifts of God to man and is one of the two institutions that, after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. When the divine principles are recognized and obeyed in this relation, marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race and it provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. What a wonderful ideal. This week's lesson looks at some of the principles behind it. And uh, Sunday's lesson, the first uh, comment is Lotov. That really should be, I've copied it directly out of the, uh, out of the notes, uh, or out of the quarterly, but um, it's actually low with an apostrophe after it because there's an aleph instead of a wow, uh, a wow at the end of that. Um, low in the other sense would be good. Low with a stop behind it is, um, is not, or pardon me, to him it should be. And to him it is good instead of low tov, low tov. Out of a prim primeval abyss, God created our world through the supernatural power of his word. All through the creation account in chapter 1, you'll notice everything was good until the work was created, Tov, at which point everything uh, God created was pronounced very good, Tov Meod, in Genesis 1.31. In the midst of all this, however, one thing was lo tov, not good. Read Genesis 2.18, what was not good and why, and what are some of the implications of this text. And uh, that's our memory verse again. It is not good that man should be alone. God had declared all aspects of the creation good up to the time when he created Adam. At that point, Adam was the only human. Although he was made in the image of God, in his aloneness he could not reflect the full image of God, which exists in relationship with other parts of the Godhead. And by the way, throughout Genesis has that. Um, let us make man in our image. 
and then later on, uh, lest the man has become like one of us, lest he should take and extend his hand and eat and live forever. One of us. The Godhead, of course, is composed of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's, of course, standard Christian doctrine. Thus, Adam needed someone like himself with whom he could form a relationship of mutual love and cooperation, reflecting the loving relationship exemplified within the Godhead. And then, it says, read Genesis 2, 19 through 21, after what act does God cause Adam to sleep and then from his flesh create a wife? And how might that previous act be related to God's creation of a wife for Adam? And the full text, I'm going to skip verse 21, because uh, that simply places things. But out of the ground, God, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. So... It not only says he did all that stuff, but it actually gives you the point, which is, for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. Interestingly, the apes weren't good enough. Perhaps the key here is found in the last phrase of verse 20. As he named the animals, Adam must have noticed that they came in pairs, male and female. Unlike himself, who was a singular creation, we can be sure that the Lord all along intended for Adam to have a wife. Perhaps the Lord intended to create a longing in Adam, the sense that something was missing in his own existence, which would make him that much more appreciative of the gift that God, the Lord was going to give him in a wife. Maybe men are more dense than women in this regard. Consider the contrast between good of the rest of the creation and the declaration not good in regard to Adam's solitude what does this indicate about the value of relationships? And, and then it asks the question, what can you do to strengthen whatever valuable relationships that you are in now? And uh, that's something that's open to discussion afterwards. Uh, a companion for Adam, Genesis 2.20, in which Adam names the animals, helps to reveal the great gap between humans and other earthly creatures. There was no animal that was comparable to Adam. Not even among the apes was there any creature like Adam because Adam was not like an ape. This is an important point for us to remember because so many in our society promote the idea that humans are nothing more than advanced apes. We are not apes and an ape was no more suitable as a companion for Adam than it would be for one of us. Read Genesis 2, 21 and 22. What significance is found in the method by which God created a companion for Adam? And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in, instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. As God had personally crafted Adam's body from the dust of the ground, so he personally crafted Eve's body using one of Adam's ribs. God did not need Adam's rib to create Eve. He could have created her as he had created Adam or even spoken her into existence. But God had a reason for forming Eve out of one of Adam's ribs. If the two had been created completely separately, it could indicate that by nature they were completely independent individuals. But the sharing of flesh in both persons indicated that the two were to be united and were intended to be one flesh. After being created, Eve was brought to Adam to be his helper she was made from Adam and given to Adam. The process by which God created Eve showed clearly that God could provide any companion that Adam needed. This point became important later when Adam faced the temptation of whether to join Eve in the eating of the fruit or to trust God to take care of the situation. Adam had ample reason to believe that God could take care of him and this made his sin the more grievous. Read Genesis 2:23. What was Adam's response to Eve? And... Uh, 
Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That's been reformatted from the King James, but uh, other translations will have it in that format. And that gives you kind of the parallels. Uh, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. Uh, and this is synthetic poetry, and this is parallel poetry. Adam was so excited when he saw Eve that he sang out in poetry. This is the first poem in the Bible, and that's incorrect, as we will see. Uh, but it is the second poem in the Bible, and reflects Adam's regard for his wife and the closeness of their relationship. She was to be his equal, another aspect of creation that was damaged by the fall. The ideal marriage, author William Faulkner once called marriage a failure and wrote that the only way to get any peace out of it is to keep the first one and stay as far away from her as much as you can with the hope of someday outliving her. Uh, what a sad commentary on the state of many marriages. I have to agree with that. Read Mark 7, uh, 10, 7 through 9. What text did Jesus quote in this passage? And what characteristics of a good marriage can be found here in the words of Jesus? Now, the full context has to do with, uh, first, that Moses, the law of Moses was not as much of an ideal as the uh, creation account. And then it quotes Genesis 1, God made them male and female. But then it goes on to say, and again, this is a quote, a direct quote, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And then the quote finishes, so they are no more twain but one flesh. Therefore what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder, which is repeated at uh, many many Christian marriages. The benefits of leaving one's parents in order to create a home within, with one's spouse are so well known that they hardly need to be mentioned. Problems with in-laws are one of the leading causes of marital discord. One of the first steps to take when establishing a happy home is to respect the independence of the marriage partners by the establishment of a home separate from the parents when at all possible. In cases when it is not possible, the privacy and intimacy of marriage should still be respected. And I will make another point, and this particular text is obviously not from um, a, not a simple product of the life of the Israelites. Because by that time, people tend to live in a patriarchal society where you didn't move out from your father and your mother. But in fact, you stayed with them, uh, perhaps in a tent next door, but, uh, but uh, leaving the father and mother was not actually part of the Israelite experience. So this is an ideal that goes back further than Israelite culture. Which argues that it doesn't really belong to the time of Moses. It belongs to a much earlier time when God originally set things up. Unity is another feature of a good marriage. Unity does not mean that the two partners should give up the use of their separate brains, but that they should be united in their purpose to the, do the very, the very best for each other and for their union. Jesus also emphasized the lasting nature of marriage. Marriage is not a casual relationship to be entered into or dismissed at well. It is a lifetime commitment. Those who are not prepared to commit themselves for life should postpone such a step until they are ready. Read Ephesians 5, 22 through 25. In what ways do these verses reveal the principles of a good marriage? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be, sub be to their own husbands in everything. And then it goes on to talk about the husbands, and unfortunately, they don't include all of the rest of the text. 
Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It is the husband's privilege to give himself for his wife in loving service as Christ gave himself for the church. In turn, the wife is to respect her husband and to cooperate in their work towards their mutual goals. Here's the solution to the discord that sin has brought into the marriage relationship. Self-sacrificing love will be met by loving respect and mutual happiness. Our homes can be a foretaste of heaven. And of course, this gets into, again, a hotly debated subject in uh, uh, in our modern world. Protecting what's precious. One of the greatest examples of God's love for humanity can be found in human sexuality. It is truly a wonderful gift from God, yet as with all gifts that we've been given, it doesn't come unconditionally. That is, that it's not something we can just do as we please. God has set some rules. Indeed, he is very clear. Sexual activities are between, to be between a husband and wife, male and female, and only in the context of marriage. Anything outside of that is sin. And of course, that last uh, couple of sentences is um, politically incorrect today. Read Matthew 5, 27 through 30. Look at how seriously Jesus takes the issues with which he is dealing here. What is ultimately at stake? And he talks, of, this is the Sermon on the Mount, of course. You've heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And by the way, I think this is the only place in the Bible where it condemns pornography. Which is fascinating. And uh, we, may, uh, we may get into some interesting discussions on that uh, later on. Uh, some research that's coming out that suggests it's not a good idea. But then everybody really knows that. Um, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. And if thy internet connection offend thee, then get rid of it. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> that's, that's the modern version. <clears throat> However much we like to focus, and rightly so, and all the grace and forgiveness that Jesus bestows upon sinners, we can't forget the high standards of morality that he lived and preached. It's hard to imagine how Jesus could have expressed more strongly the warning against sexual immorality as revealed in these few verses. Plucking out your eye, cutting out off your hand, if this is what it takes to be pure, then it's worth it. Otherwise, you're in danger of losing your eternal life. Pretty strong stuff. Ellen White comments, uh, if all who profess to obey the law of God were free from iniquity, my soul would be delivered, but they are not. Even some who profess to keep all the commandments of God are guilty of the sin of adultery. What can I say to arise, arouse their benumbed sensibilities? Moral principle, strictly carried out, becomes the only safeguard of the soul. How, excuse me. However strong Jesus' warning is here, we must not forget the story about the woman caught in the act of adultery. How do we strike the right balance between the upholding of the standards that Jesus talked about in the above verses, while at the same time showing grace and compassion to those who fall, as revealed in this story? That is a difficult balance to maintain and it hasn't always been maintained. Marriage is a metaphor for the church. It is well known among students of the Bible that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, marriage is used as a symbol of the relationship between God and his covenant people. That's why, for example, on numerous occasions, the Bible uses the image of an unfaithful woman to symbolize the apostasy and backsliding that were prevalent in ancient Israel. For example, back in Exodus, the Lord said to his people that they should not enter into any kind of close relationship with the pagans around them, because the pagans were very perverse people who could lead Israel astray. And uh, of course, that warning has been given in a number of other times as well. Exodus 34, 15, and 16, and the, the image 
uh, that it gives um, in uh, Exodus 34, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods. And it's probably worth mentioning that it was quite literal whoring after their gods. And it's probably mention, uh, worth mentioning that uh, uh, for political correctness, um, nowadays the idea that uh, marriage is that sacred is also something that's kind of fuzzy. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go whoring after their gods. Um, Interestingly, the uh, Israelites seem to be more protective of their daughters than of their sons. And uh, the Jeremiah passage that's re referred to, Jeremiah 3.14, is, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And then the quarterly goes on to say, at the same time, the image of the church as the bride of Christ points towards unity among believers and with Christ, especially when understood in the context of the biblical ideal for marriage, one man and one woman in a loving, self-sacrificing relationship. Read Ephesians 5, 28 and 32, and Revelation 5, 19, 5 through 9, and it asks, what are these texts teaching? And this is, of course, the other side of the uh, of the marriage thing that we just uh, looked at, uh, so ought men to love their wi their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man yet ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the Church. And uh, the passage basically says that for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery but I speak concerning of Christ and the church and it's probably fair to say that mystery is something that's revealed that it applies doubly rather than uh, we're totally confused about this. And then of course the uh, I'm not sure why they started with verse 5 because verse 7 is, um, is actually where everything uh, starts. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready, the wife of course being the church. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clear and clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. In these texts, the relationship within the ideal marriage is compared with the relationship of God and his people. God invites his people to join with him in an intimate relationship. This is amazing, an amazing picture of God's interest in his people and his desire to bring us into his fellowship. What choices, the quarterly asks, what choices can you make that will draw you closer to the Lord and closer to the ideal represented in the biblical concept of marriage? Why is it a matter of the choices that you and you alone can make? And uh, we'll leave that question uh, to the end for those of you who wish to comment on it. And then we change uh, a little bit. Uh, this is now Friday's study and it's further study. In many ways, a proper understanding of morality, especially sexual morality, is clearly tied to a proper understanding of our origins. And if you want to know why the politically correct stuff is going astray, it's because they don't have the right concept of origins. For example, evolutionary philosophy does not provide an objective basis for any link between sexual activity and morality. Animals have many different types of mating systems. Some species are polygamous, many are promiscuous. If you take your model from the animals, then you know you choose what particular kind happens to suit you best. A few species are mostly monogamous, but genetic studies have revealed that many species, not all, 
that appear to be monogamous are not actually so. In many species, a female may give birth to a group of offspring that are not all fathered by the same individual, even though the father stays to help. Without the objective standard of morality given by the creator, we would have no basis for the evaluation of sexual behavior as morally good or bad. If you take your cue from the animals. So does it matter if the animals, for example, some animals have homosexual activity? Not really, because that's not where our ideals come from, unless our goal is to be animals. Without the objective standard of morality given by the Creator, we would have no basis for the evaluation of sexual behavior as morally good or bad. The current push to approve homosexual partnerships illustrates this point. It is only in the light of creation that marriage is properly understood. And then an Ellen White quote to finish it, um, in both the Old and New Testament, the marriage relation is employed to represent the tender and sacred union be that exists between Christ and his people. To the mind of Jesus, the gladness of the wedding festivities pointed forward to the rejoicing of that day when he shall bring home his bride to his father's house and the redeemed with the redeemer shall sit down to the marriage supper of the lamb now i'm going to switch now to the uh, book that the companion book that uh, dr gibson wrote on uh, to the uh, quarterly and just find some excerpts from it that I'll bring out. Um, judicial systems sometimes use loneliness as the ultimate punishment short of execution. It's called solitary confinement. And uh, he comments, notice that the woman was God's idea. Even though Adam saw everything with pears, he couldn't figure out exactly what to do about it. And of course, there was nothing he could do about it. And then it mentions here that it was the first poem ever composed by a human, and that's more accurate than the first poem ever, because the first poem is actually another poem, uh, believe it or not, on sexuality. And it is, uh, you may remember it, uh, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, Male and female created he them. And that's the real poetry in the Genesis 1 account. People who try to make the entire thing in poetry are just don't understand Hebrew or more likely don't want to understand Hebrew that much. And then he, he says, which is again somewhat politically incorrect, unrepentant adulteries will be excluded from heaven. But what if they do everything else really nicely? Um, and then he compares creationist and evolutionist views on marriage. And he compares them on the basis of permanence, on the basis of fidelity, and on the basis of offspring. And uh, he says, Evolutionary theory provides no basis for opposing such practices as infanticide and selective breeding. That, of course, doesn't mean that all evolutionists are happy with infanticide and selective breeding, although some are. But the arguments of evolutionists who object to these practices, and he mentions specifically promiscuity, serial polygamy, sexual infidelity, and eugenics, and I would add one more, Abortion, on moral grounds, rest on the foundation of creation, whether or not they recognize this. And uh, he, he quotes Nancy Piercy as uh, noticing that what's going on really here is the people who are moral are engaging in what you could call philosophical cheating.
Now, my own take on this lesson is that I think this lesson is one of the central reasons why the doctrine of creation is so important. It's not the only one. We've been over last week, we spoke about the belief in miracles. Uh, next week, we'll talk about the Sabbath. Uh, we'll be talking about a number of things. The environment, uh, pardon me, next week we'll talk about the environment and the week after that, the Sabbath. Um, and um, this week, we're noting that the nuclear family is hard to justify scientifically. Now, I don't mean by that that the nuclear family can't be justified scientifically. That if you were being strictly uh, objective, um, that you couldn't find that, you know, divorce, for example, is not a good idea and should have very specific reasons uh, that is divorce really is, from a moral point of view, only legitimate when it is a recognition of something that's already taken place and has become irreversible. But my point is that it was at one time believed that divorce had little effect on children. And it was rather loudly proclaimed. Of course, this was very convenient because that meant that if you got divorced, it wasn't a big deal, you know, just move on to the next partner. Um, and um, then Judith Wallerstein's research, interestingly, when she started it, it was definitely the only research of its kind. And I'm not able to find where anybody has ever really tried to reproduce her research. I think because they're afraid of what the results might show. But her research clearly destroyed that hypothesis. Children of divorced families do not do as well as children from intact homes. They just don't. Um, maybe I should say we just don't. But you think of all the damage that was done before that research came out. Yes? The children in destructive marriages you know, may not do as well as those from divorced homes. Um, you know, that particular question has not been analyzed with the depth that it should be. These were, the, these were actually middle-class divorces that were being looked at. Um, but different, different kids at different ages are affected differently, but they still wind up with long-term difficulties. And My point is not that divorce is never justified. My point is that divorce is damaging and it requires justification, which was not true in certain circles of political correctness back when I grew up. But it's now pretty well recognized as being true. Now the question that I have, how long will it take and how much damage will be done before we discover that, for example, putting gay marriage on an equal legal footing with regular marriage, with standard marriage, with marriage period, if I can put it that way, is damaging. How many, how many legs does a sheep have if you call its tail a leg? And according to Abraham Lincoln, uh, Four, because calling its tail a leg doesn't make it one. And um, the problem didn't start with gay marriage, unfortunately. It actually started with at least adultery and perhaps even before that with the acceptance of premarital sex because those were the easiest cases and then it progresses beyond and beyond and beyond. And pretty soon anything goes. And that's where the end of this is. 
In fact, you can see some very interesting discussions between Rick Santorum and some gay activists who say plainly that they really don't care if it destroys regular marriage. But the, the point is that modern society is unlikely to admit this until it is proven. In fact, there's still people that are opposed to Judith Wallerstein's research. And in many cases, not even then. And to be fair, the problem is, very simply, science can't prove anything. And so if you need wiggle room, you can always find it. And so the real question here is not, can it be proved? But the real question is, are you looking for the truth or not with the highest probability of being correct? And so it doesn't matter how much evidence piles up against, uh, against the idea that, that, uh, that gay marriage is exactly equivalent to standard marriage and should be recognized by the state in the same way. It doesn't really matter. Because these are people who want to do their own thing and they're ready to, uh, ready to uh, twist any statistics that they get, grab ones that support them, ignore ones that don't, and basically turn science on its head as an objective search for truth. And the political stuff is so strong that basically you're going to destroy science as a way of finding truth. I will finally throw out the discussion questions that are at the end of the uh, quarterly and uh, then turn the discussion list to you. Darwinism denies anything like the biblical creation. What rules for sexual behavior, if any, does Darwinism provide and how do they contrast with the biblical ideal? That's question number one. Question number two, what are some biblical examples of good marriages and happy homes? And it says, name some biblical examples of unhappy marriages and homes, and what can we learn from both? Number three, review the description of the virtuous wife in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. And the question asks, uh, what should be the character of the husband of such a wife? And then finally, in what ways can your local church be a place that can help to affirm and strengthen the ideals of marriage? And what practical things can your church do in order to accomplish that goal? And I would add to that one, are there any things that uh, each of us personally can do to accomplish that goal? And with that, I will open up the floor to discussion. Well, I think uh, we should mention uh, that Bob Brown, a former attendee of this class for several years, uh, passed away this last week uh, in West Virginia. Uh, he used to be director of the Geoscience Research Institute in the 70s, uh, a very brilliant mind. Before that, he was president of Union College when I was there. Yeah, he was there for a couple of years as president of Union College. And, uh, a man who uh, loyalty to the church is unparalleled, his loyalty to the Bible, his loyalty to God. Uh, highly and he did some very important work on carbon-14 dating and amino acid dating. Exactly. Uh, and uh, statistically, he demonstrated, you know, he is the one, I think, that originated the idea of a residual level of carbon-14 and pre-flood uh, things. And this idea is spread, and it's spreading more and more now that uh, 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 through the, um, at least, uh, apologetic literature, 
uh, as a very firm and uh, demonstrable uh, uh, scientific fact that challenges the radiometric dates. And uh, radiometric dates are challenged by radiometric, some radiometric data. It's probably fair to say yeah. he was the, the, <laughs> the earliest person to, uh, to come up with that idea. Yeah. Yeah, and it, uh, it took him the credit. And amino acid dating, uh, he showed, uh, as we well know, that uh, the constant of amino acid racemization, which was the dating basis, the basis for dating, uh, that constant var varied by a factor of a thousand, and it increased and increased more as you went into the older samples which completely negates that system as a method, an independent method of dating. Well, it does, uh, it does more than that. If you change those constants to actually be constant, uh, uh, you come up with a much shorter time frame. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's, it's not mm -hmm. just that it's a random error. Mm -hmm. It's a specific error that looks like it uh, was created to protect a uh, time frame. Uh, and another uh, important uh, feature of his research that comes to mind is uh, uh, the correlation of tree rings between tree samples. He uh, looked into that thing and he showed how uh, so many extremely highly claimed correlations between, between tree rings were valueless uh, because of certain uh, quirks of, of the way tree trees uh, go into dormant periods and so on at times uh, that you get very high correlation and it means nothing essentially in terms of some of those correlations so uh, uh, I, I think uh, an icon has passed away but uh, we can learn from him I'd like to mention the fact that uh, Maurice Venden uh, died, I think a few days ago, and he he's a great preacher. I uh, even today I listen to his preaching, but I was amazed that he's dead, but he's still preaching. Now I, I want well, to make the, you know there's a text in the Bible for that. Yeah. He being dead still speaketh. Right. Now, uh, I want to make a comment about gay marriage. Is gay marriage detrimental to society? I think common sense should say yes, because we don't live forever. I mean, if we are lucky, we get to 90 or maybe some of us, 100. But after that, what happens? Now, the birth rate in uh, Germany, Russia, Italy, Japan, and the U.S. is way below what is necessary to preserve the uh, society. It's like 1.3 per, and we need 2.1. Now, fortunately, there are enough Muslims who, <laughs> who uh, have many children and they fill the gap. And there's enough um, Mexicans and from other countries willing to come in and uh, do, uh, do what we neglect to do. So, gay marriage, suppose we were uh, in our gay people were successful in convincing everybody that gay marriage and lesbian marriage is the best way to go. What would happen? Civilization would be destroyed. Well, two things would happen. One of them is our population would decrease rather dramatically. And the second one is that uh, our population would increasingly become either Mormon or Catholic in which case um, uh, the influence of that uh, particular ideology would dramatically decrease. 
I think this is something that people who are arguing for it don't realize is that it's not a it's not a stable position for for people in general because those who disagree are going to take over. It's that simple. You remind me of a letter I wrote to Diane Feinstein uh, a couple of years ago, and I I in in this letter I said, uh, uh, "Do you realize that?" If Democrats continue uh, supporting abortion, since the values are usually copied by children from parents, eventually Democrats will disappear because because you know they they teach that abortion is okay. That means they they're gonna annihilate their own their own uh, uh, people. That is, uh, that is true of, of interest also, is that the, a disproportionate share of abortions are done in black people. If I were a black person, I think I would be very upset about that. As a matter of fact, I am somewhat upset about that just as a person. I think that that's wrong. And interestingly enough, the people who started abortions thought that was right because they were inferior humans, they shouldn't be reproducing. And so this is one way of making them not reproduce. And they were very explicit about that. You, you read Margaret Sanger sometime and, and think about the political correctness of uh, race and it'll curl your hair. No, I, that's well. The, the I, I think that the point there is that that rape does permanent damage in a number of different ways. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know of any segment of society that defends rape except for. There are a few evolutionists who have defended rape on the idea that, well, you know, it's just another reproductive strategy. And if you don't have any moral compass, how do you argue with them? And yet most of us, I think, instinctively have enough of a moral compass to say, you get this far, something's wrong. But I, you know, they've they've debated people, and 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 if you're if you're arguing from an evolutionary perspective, where there are no fixed morals except for what you can derive from science, which are precious for you, um, it's a problem. Yes. Okay. I, I wanted to. Uh, mentioned something that we discussed uh, last uh, Sabbath about dark matter and dark energy. I decided this week to check a little bit about uh, and I, I went to a book written by Robert Piccioni. He is an evolutionist. Mm -hmm. And he, he explains why scientists believe in dark matter and dark energy because they say there's no way after the big bang bang there's no way for the for the expansion of the universe and the formation of uh, uh, the, the the earth and the uh, and everything without a force which they label as dark matter and dark energy. So in other words, they start with the idea that they want to explain how the universe got into what it is today. They say, we're not going to use 
God as, a, as an explanation or creation. So therefore, we need some force that is invisible, that is responsible for the universe. And we call it dark energy and dark matter. Yes, that, that is true. Basically, it's, it's pulling in unknown forces and unknown objects that are, to the uninitiated, miraculous. That is, dark matter has the property that light can go right through it as if it weren't there. Uh, go ahead. I've been contemplating uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, San Bernardino, uh, America. If homosexuality was merely the cherry on top of the existing corruption at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, is America any better off now than Sodom and Gomorrah were then? Well... Treatment of the widow, the orphan, usury, in, in one sense, yes, because um, the use of homosexual rape as a, uh, as a tool, for, um, tool for murder is still not common in America. Whereas in Sodom, it was common enough that Lot knew that these people shouldn't be out in the street or they'd be in big trouble. Um, but we're getting there. I, I see, uh, going on with that idea, uh, I see the uh, deprecation of religion, uh, morality, and so on as a very basic and important trend that is going on. You don't find it uh, I mean, God is essentially excluded from politics. He's essentially excluded from the main media, uh, and so on. And uh, unless something happens, I, I think we're headed towards God has been excluded, and, and our morality is, is going to pieces, and our integrity is going to pieces. You can hardly believe anything that anybody says anymore. Uh, we need more churches, we need more monuments to religious leaders and so on to inspire our society to back to, to some, some uh, uh, standards, uh, which uh, I can only refer to the Bible as being significant. Uh, I, I mean, as being, as being the origin. Uh, unless we move in that direction, I, I think, I, you know, I, I used to be, when, you know, I, I've lived a long years when I was a young child and so on. People used to say what was true, you know, that uh, now, at least in, in the political arena, it's, it's whose side does it help? It's perfectly proper to, to, to lie. It's, and we accept this. I mean, we're just degenerating. Uh, and, and, uh, it, this has to change, I think, or we were headed towards the great trouble, of course. Uh, the Bible suggests this anyway. Uh, but um, getting back to this dark matter thing, I just want to suggest this, you know. Uh, those who believe in God and creation and so on are criticized by the scientific community uh, for, um, you know, uh, hey, how do you know what God did and what do you know? So you, anytime you have a problem, you just say God did it. Well, every time that they have a problem, they just invent dark matter. They invent dark matter, <laughs> or, or evolution, or the origin of life, uh, and so on. And uh, we need to recognize that uh, in the scientific ethos, there is a significant metaphysical factor there. And they deny it. But it is very much there. In cosmology, it's there very strongly. And in, I'd say in evolution, it's strongly there. And in those two areas especially, is uh, science guilty of uh, uh, 
in delving in metaphysics, it's fine for them to do it if they recognize it, but to claim they don't is where I, I see a, a problem. I just remember one uh, additional detail about uh, dark matter and dark energy. Uh, Piccioni, Dr. Piccioni, the evolutionist, he says there is gravity, the force of gravity. We understand gravity. We can measure it. We can explain it. Now, if we didn't have dark matter and dark energy, the universe would never have expanded because gravity would, it works in the opposite direction. We, he says, we don't see dark matter, we don't see dark energy, but we know we need it to explain the expansion of the universe. And he says this expansion will go forever and forever because of dark matter and dark energy. Please, may I take the liberty of commenting on my brother Nick here. <laughs> uh, dark energy is totally different from dark matter. These are not to be confused. Dark matter came first. and It came first because, uh, assuming that, there, that we have an expanding universe uh, after the alleged Big Bang, there had to be a force which brought all the discrete celestial objects into being, which brought the, the galaxies together and then suns and stars and things. And the only force that has been invoked to accomplish that is gravity. It has to work for a long, long time. But when physicists and others got to work, they, they came to the point of realizing that gravity alone doesn't do that very well. If I can use an example, uh, if you fill this amphitheater with smoke, with smoke, that is, finely, finely divided particles, and you waited long enough, would that smoke end up being a small thimble full of matter? No, because when it's sufficiently rarefied and spread out, gravity doesn't work effectively, efficiently to bring it all together. So it was in the, in the plasma resulting from the Big Bang. And so in order, in order to make gravity succeed in forming celestial objects, they had to have a lot more mass in the original product of the Big Bang. Now, the whole thing is, is, of course, it's speculative, but that's where, where dark matter came from. And so it wasn't until the 1990s that dark energy came into prominence because somebody somewhere uh, noted that there was an ex not just an expansion of the universe, but the rate of expansion was increasing. That was accelerating, and it required a force to cause that acceleration of the expansion. And what, what force can we invoke to accomplish that? It had to be something called dark energy, very different from gravity. I might say now that, that there is a, an increasing movement of scientists uh, which is being given the name of the Thunderbolt Project, which is saying, uh, and on scientific uh, reasons alone, that gravity is not sufficient of a force to explain the universe that we see. And they are invoking the electric forces in the universe. I was at a conference in Albuquerque in January where uh, uh, which this thunderbolt thing was brought together actually and the electric forces available in the cosmos 
are at least a thousand times as powerful as gravity is. And so uh, we may be facing a rewriting of the whole of fundamental cosmology because these were 300 people gathered together in Albuquerque with no religious uh, uh, motivation whatsoever but to in fact combining their brains together to put together a new cosmogony and when I was listening to their lectures there wasn't one that wasn't insisting on a much shortening of the history of the cosmos much younger than it has been assumed to be all these years. Sorry for that comment. Nick? By, by but the way, can I ask how much younger? Uh, how much? No, no, I listened carefully. Uh, there was no, no... Um, In other words, uh, the, reason I, the reason I'm asking is because if it gets under four and a half billion years, then that makes dating of the solar system quite interesting. And that's why I was asking. I mean, if you're saying much younger, like in, you know, 10 billion years, you could probably still have the solar system the way it is. But if it's, uh, but if it says, well, you can do this in two and a half billion years, then all of a sudden the dating of the solar system becomes um, problematic, shall we say. Oh, uh, s quite a lot of these people that I'm just referring to give a lot of respect to the speculations of Emmanuel Velikovsky. Now, he's a very controversial and in some circles a, a very um, uh, despicable character, but he was a brilliant man. Spoke six languages and he wrote books which some of you have read. You've got something to say down there. Yeah, wasn't the dark energy from an experiment using capacitor plates Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't confirm or deny what you're saying. Okay. Do you, capacitor plates? I believe the, the origin of the dark energy or a proof of the dark energy came from a capacitor plate experiment. Such experiments may have been involved, but from my reading, uh, whenever dark, uh, whenever uh, dark energy is referred to, it is linked with the observation that the rate of expansion of the universe is increasing. That's, that's the connection that sticks in my mind. Just what the laboratory testing may have involved, I don't know. I, like I think to that is correct. I, w I would point out one other thing, and then uh, maybe we can have the the uh, microphone can, can down I here. Come to that. my friend. Uh, uh, I, I, I offer earlier today, I offered the microphone to him. He didn't want to take it. So <laughs> I, I thought maybe if I said something else, he will. <laughs> 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 By the way, the, what, uh, what you said is true. It's all connected to the expansion, the theory of the expansion of the universe. Now, it is interesting that Piccioni says the galaxies don't expand. We don't expand. This building is not expanding. It's only in the outskirts of the universe that the universe is expanding. How convenient this explanation is. Because there is an, uh, another theory which is supported by many scientists and they call it the steady state theory which the and they do not accept the idea that the universe is expanding tremendously now it's interesting that dr piccioni in referring to the dark matter and the dark energy he says these are mysterious forces Mystery, of course, that's the best explanation. When you d deny the miracle and the existence of God, then you resort to mystery. Well, I, I will say this much about the, the expanding 
the expanding universe is that the steady state universe is also expanding, but what's happening is that matter is coming into being de novo, usually considered to be in the form of hydrogen for one in every uh, cubic meter per year or something like that. It's a, it's a very small, very difficult to measure amount. Um, but of course, if matter is coming into being for no obvious reason, then it raises the question of whether things like Earth's or solar systems could come into being for no obvious reason too. Um, and so that's kind of an uncomfortable quasi-theological uh, uh, part of the steady state that's, that's uh, not often talked about. Uh, <laughs> beyond that, uh, I think it's probably important to point out one other advantage of dark matter besides uh, that it causes galaxies and so forth to clump together. And that is that if you look at galaxies, they are commonly spiral galaxies. I mean, there are elliptical galaxies as well <coughs> that look like they've been wound so many times that you can't tell that there's any difference. But there are a large proportion of galaxies are spiral, I think probably a majority. And the spirals are usually wound about maybe two times or so. They're not wound four, five, twenty. And why should a galaxy that is supposedly hundreds, uh, maybe billions of years old, still have only two winds in it? There are even barred galaxies that have less than one b wind in them. Uh, how does a galaxy do that? And dark matter pro provides a way of having the outside of the galaxy wind faster, relatively speaking, than the inside, because the inside is inside the sphere of dark matter, and so it doesn't experience any gravity from that dark matter. Whereas the outside is outside of it, and so it catches up, and so or it doesn't catch up, but it doesn't, it doesn't lag behind as far as you would expect it to. And so what's happened is by this theory that, uh, that the galaxies look younger than they really are because the dark matter is causing them not to wind up as fast as you'd otherwise predict. Because the further away it, uh, something is, the, the, the slower the orbit is. And so dark matter fulfills those two things. Uh, but it's still bizarre because it's matter for which there is no evidence whatsoever other than that the galaxies look younger than they are and that the galaxies have actually been formed. Um, both of which could be prerogatives of a deity. But dark matter is, is advantageous because, uh, because you don't have to worry about it uh, accounting for your sins. Or maybe not. <laughs> um, I don't, from, our, from where we look, I don't think so. Go ahead. Some comments have been, some comments have been made earlier that, um, well, gravity we know, we understand, and dark matter we don't. I uh, just want to comment uh, that a lot of things about gravity we don't understand. I mean, basically, why, why, why does it work? Uh, and we're dealing actually with two different levels of ignorance here, uh, and. Uh, we need to keep that in mind. Our information is shallow compared to reality. You're, you're of course right because one of the things that we do with uh, we do with laws is we assume that because we know their mathematical form that we know how they work, and and in the case of quantum mechanics, that's definitely not true. We know the mathematical form of quantum mechanics quite well. We have no clue as to how it works mechanically. 
it is time for us to close down, I presume. Uh, it's, it's getting close, yes. <laughs> uh, I would just like to leave with a challenge, please. Uh, a challenge to you and to the rest of this group. Because yesterday I received an email from the president of Creation Ministries International, Dr. Carl Wieland. He's an Australian with the headquarters, the world headquarters in Brisbane. I visited them one month ago. And uh, just to let him know what Seventh-day Adventists are studying and learning and teaching these days, I presented to him a copy of this quarter's Sabbath School lessons. Interesting. Written by our own James Gibson. Yes, well, he has obviously, he has spent some time reading that quarterly quite carefully, and he sent me his conclusions yesterday. Our church, or our community of faith, is out of step with all of the three large creation organizations, that is, Creation Ministries International, Answers in Genesis, and the Institute for Creation Research. All of those three are insisting that the whole cosmos was brought into existence during the six days of the creation week. And prior to that, there was nothing. I mean, zilch. <clears throat> However, Adventists have not taken that position, and uh, the quarterly does present as an option the idea that the cosmos itself is quite old. And Wheeland, and I presume most of these other colleagues in other Christian organizations, are, uh, are alleging, and this is what yesterday's email said, alleging that that we are threatening the, the credibility of the scriptures because they quote in my face Exodus 20.11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all that in them is. And that includes the remote galaxies. So we have to, we have to answer this. Uh, I, I know that this matter has been dealt with. Uh, quite a bit before, but it's something that has come to the surface just yesterday in my email. I'll let Ariel, Ariel Roth uh, talk about that. Uh, this, this dichotomy has been going on for 30, 40 years. Uh, and uh, these groups have at times stated we are not creationists because we believe that the universe is older than uh, the 6,000 year description and so on and uh, this is often discussed within Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, I've had uh, email correspondence with uh, some of my friends in Ukraine uh, just a couple weeks ago about this issue. It, it, it's controversial and it's interesting and I've spent many hours of my life discussing it uh, back and forth uh, and so on. Uh, I don't know why it attracts so much attention because you know it's, it's not a vital point to, to salvation uh, but uh, it certainly seems to uh, generate a lot of interest and uh, uh, some people are shocked uh, in our church to think that hey uh, we believe in a six-day creation, but we want an older universe, and there were two creations, and so on. And uh, you can understand their thinking along that particular line. But uh, uh, I would I would uh, mention what I've mentioned here before, and that is, there are several texts in the Bible that seem to imply that the Earth was created out of water, uh, and so on, and the three or four of them, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, Ellen White is quite clear that there, there were other uh, bodies before uh, Creation Week. And it's so much easier for us to answer the, uh, how did this light from all these galaxies, uh, God could create the light from the galaxies and so on. But this uh, is 
it seems more contrived, and so we, you, you, you tend to lean towards that. You want to know maybe uh, they've been here for a while since the light has reached us, uh, and they're uh, billions of years away, uh, well, light years away, and so on. So uh, this is, this is uh, an important issue as far as uh, what is being made out of it, uh, but I, uh, I don't think that uh, is all that significant. I, you know, some say, well, uh, God created the sea uh, in the Ten Commandments, and some say, well, no, that just refers to the third day of creation week and so on, and you can, alternative interpretations are possible. I don't think this is a cardinal issue. Well, I, I will say this much, that in my contact with the ICR, which is the one I've had the most contact with, and with what I have read on, on, uh, from people uh, in other organizations, I have found them to be treating me as a colleague, uh, as not a person who has simply left the faith and is no longer worth uh, dealing with. And so I think that I appreciate their concerns. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that that particular issue has to be the only issue with which we have discussions with them. And there are a lot of issues on which we share a great deal of common ground and they recognize that as well. Yes, and I think, well, let's this be the last word. The, one of the differences between any other creationist group and Seventh-day Adventists really comes into play with the great controversy. And Lucifer, which took place in heaven before creation on this earth, but after creation of the universe, you know, took place. And Ellen White spells it out so clearly, so you could use that if you wanted to speak to the devil and this earth being the lesson book of the universe, the whole point of creation here. Well, I can tell you how they answer that. And that is, they view, because I've brought that question up to them, and their, in their view, in their view it's an entirely different universe that's separate from ours and uh, makes no contact with it. Um, and you have to have some contact. You have to have some contact, otherwise the devil couldn't be thrown out into this world. Uh, there, there's got to be some doors somewhere that are open. Of course, if you're going that way, you can always say, well, those are miraculous doors. Um, the driving force behind this is that, in their view, uh, everything in the Bible has to be taken both correct and literally and without significant change in the, um, in the text. And so what we see in the Hebrew is what we get. And we have to accommodate everything to that. And there is the matter of the greater light and the lesser light and the stars also. And see, they're concluded in the fourth day. You're stuck with that. And that's, that's where they see, if you don't take a universe that's, uh, uh, that's created in the six days as well, then you're gonna have to live with that. Um, I can respect that position. I can understand it. I'm not sure that I entirely agree with it. Uh, and I think that our protection of the, sa of, the, uh, of the creation account derives from a different source, and that is from the Sabbath commandment. Well, what do they do with that? Well, not taking that literally. <clears throat> well, uh, <laughs> You know, that's, that's the interesting thing is that they are, taking, uh, they are taking the six days of the Sabbath commandment literally. 
um, but they're not taking the commandment itself literally. Uh, I think that there's this, a semi-stable position and that with time it will eventually bifurcate into either accepting the whole Sabbath commandment, including the fact that it's a commandment, or uh, going the other way and just uh, letting go of the, of, the, uh, of the last part of it as well. But, you know, that's, that's my opinion. Uh, well, we're not going to quit, are we? <laughs> go ahead uh, and, and you, hand him the mic. You start this topic and it never ends. <laughs> a fair amount of my life has been spent discussing this. Uh, but I... Um, I understand that this viewpoint uh, that we are excluded by them and uh, your comment emphasizes what we've felt over the years. Uh, be over this issue I, uh, I regret. I do find it easier to uh, interpret certain scientific data if uh, you could allow for more time. I, I'm speaking of. I and you're not asking for 13.7 billion years either. No, but uh, uh, the light issue is one. I do find it a little more comfortable to understand some of the radiometric dates if there was an Earth year before creation week. And it, it permits me at least to. Uh, uh, work in the scientific realm a little more easily than to just uh, claim, well, no, there was nothing here before 6,000 years. A lot of people are saying, what did God do before that? Uh, but uh, I don't think that's a strongly valid comment because I'm not sure our concept of time is realistic. Well, <laughs> beyond that, if you use that as an argument, then, then the counter argument to that is, well, all you're doing is putting it off 13 billion years. Yes. No. So I, then, what did God do before 13.7 billion years ago? And you, and you ask yourself the question, you know, hey, how come there's anything instead of nothing? I really have a problem with that question. How come there's anything instead of nothing? Uh, except I have to get out of simple cause and effect, the fact that hey, there is something here. And uh, simple cause and effect is not going to explain that. There's a reality beyond that. Well, you can leave simple cause and effect in as long as you have a cause that uh, was older than the universe. Yeah, but no, I'm thinking of the cause, the, the cause of the cause is what I'm thinking of. Well, there, there's an uncaused cause. Um. Just on the way out. Paul, I think we need to uh, give some forewarning that three weeks from now, on March 9, there's going to be a visiting professor here at Loma Linda. Uh, he's Professor Andy McIntosh from the University of Leeds in England. And he is Professor of Engineering and Thermodynamics and Combustion Theory at the University of Leeds. And he is a Bible-adhering scientist who uh, travels around the world lecturing on the interface between f Christian faith and science. So he's going to be our guest on that date, March 9. Because of the change in the locations of Sabbath school classes, I'm not sure whether we will have that meeting in the Randall Amphitheater as originally planned. It may be somewhere else, but uh, we'll have to let you know subsequently. Andy McIntosh is the name. I've heard him lecture at Cornell University. He's a very authoritative, uh, robust scientist who really sticks closely to the Word of God. If you believe in the literal creation of the rest of the universe on the fourth day, what was the state of the universe around Earth on the third day? Well, you're, you're asking somebody who uh, 
who uh, sees the possibility of the rest of the universe being there for longer, a longer period of time. I understand. I'm not tied to 13.7 billion years, although I don't have any theological reason to object to it at this point. Um, but how they would explain it, uh, probably the best explanation and the one that's going around uh, uh, as the most popular one is one that was given by Russell Humphreys and he says we lived in a white hole. And so the time for us was seven days, time for the rest of the universe was billions of years. And that works, I guess. Um, and so uh, with a white hole, you could have that. And he even discusses the kinds of things that would happen during that time, although I don't quite have that picture in mind when I, when I see the, the creation. I see it more of a, uh, more of a, a calm effect than trying to tr treat the entire universe. But uh, it's probably the best, uh, the best argument. The, the, one, the one caution I would make about that is, what it says is that the universe is going to appear to be as old as anybody says it is. And so from a scientific standpoint, it's a purely defensive move. There is no way of looking at it and saying, and if this theory is true, we should expect this that we don't expect from the standard theory. And to me, that's a face saving on the, on the order of evolutionary theory in terms of face saving. Makes no predictions that, that it's really willing to stick with. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> but what it does mean is it's not testable and that kind of pulls it out of the realm of science as far as I can tell. So I, I'm unwilling to use that as a scientific theory because if you're trying to, if you're trying to have a theory that's going to make predictions that could be wrong but in fact are right, which is what scientific theories are supposed to do, uh, then you really need, uh, you need something with a little more teeth in it. Right. Yes, Nick. Okay, I was wondering about uh, what would be the right answer to uh, argument uh, of uh, non-Adventists who are creationists in uh, the citation of Exodus, Exodus 28. Uh, you are familiar with the Hebrew. Now it says, for in six days God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. In what, what does it refer to? Does it refer to the heavens, the atmosphere? Does it refer to, uh, to the space including the, the us and the sun and the or uh, does it include the stars well actually the late dr brown probably has the best answer for that that i've seen who the late dr robert brown just died this week and his answer was how does the uh, how does the text define it and the text defines heaven as that which separates the waters from the waters. The text defines earth, and God called the dry land earth. And the text defines in the gathering together of waters he called seas. So when God created the heaven, the earth, and the seas, he's talking about the atmosphere, the um, the dry land that we are on, and the seas. And that's what God created. Now, it appears that it extends to the sun and the moon and at least some stars. But then it could, if, it talks, if it's talking about the planets, the planets are also known as kokabim, stars in Hebrew. And if the sun were to suddenly light up, the planets would suddenly appear no matter how long they had been there. Whether they had been created that day or, or, or 
Uh, and so you would have the sun, the moon, and stars being created at the same time. While the rest of the universe was beyond that may or may not have been created at that time. Uh, if God created other galaxies which are vaguely uh, appearing from Earth, or perhaps even that at that time very few stars were visible, that's a possibility too because of the way the Earth's uh, atmosphere was constructed at that point. And so you didn't have quite the view that you have now. That's a possibility too. Um, so, uh, so God could have created the solar system without creating much else and, and still get it in within the time limit that's important. Just to throw in a couple of alternatives to consider. Uh, Gerhard Hassel uh, used to talk about the sun being created on day one uh, as a source of light. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, clouds clearing on day four uh, to make it visible. Uh, another alternative that we've discussed here a few weeks ago also would be thrown in the thing. That is that the sun was there but it was not turned on till day four. As a light. As a light, yeah. I and believe so that was on. what he just said, like two minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, there, that, there, that light, light hitting Earth on day one was actually yeah. unidirectional in the same direction <clears throat> as the sun is now but in fact didn't light up the rest of the planets, didn't light up the moon, for example. Yeah, somebody was discussing the internet last night about uh, uh, God would not be unidirectional, so God could not be the source of light during the first day. I mean, there are all kinds of alternatives there that... Uh, 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 I, I think that's putting a limit on God that's not appropriate. That, uh, yeah. God could not be unidirectional? This certainly, I mean, uh, certainly, uh, it's. Um, if you pay very much attention to what's on the internet, good <laughs> luck to you. <laughs> anyway, the the interesting thing to me, to get back to the lesson itself, is that, you know, all of these discussions are interesting. Most of us, I think most of us will we'll solve them in, an, in a way which allows for the biblical account to be accurate and authoritative um, and that that informs our belief in particular of marriage. That means there's a lot of things about marriage that we're going to believe that didn't come from science first. Doesn't mean it can't be confirmed by science, but realize that science is a really blunt instrument in this area. And it may take a long time before science catches up, and it may take an even longer time if there are people throwing, you know, throwing dust in the air trying to confuse the issue. Um, I, 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 there aren't that many studies on divorced kids, for example, on, on kids of divorce. Uh, and yeah, if you limit science to mechanistic determination, you, you basically, and there are people who say, but these are only case studies. But they're multiple case studies. You know, it was, uh, there was a whole cohort that she was studying. But you don't have a control group. How do you do a control group in this kind of thing? You know, and this is the kind of problem that we have. Uh, if you take your morals from what science can prove, and until then you believe that we can do whatever we feel like, well, you're going to be doing whatever you feel like for a long, long time. And that's, that's the problem that we have, is that if you, if you start out with what I consider a firm foundation, you'll get there so much faster and in fact, if you start out not wanting to get there, 
you won't get there at all. So, next week um, we'll um, we'll be working on uh, uh, the environment. Again, we'll be getting into a politically charged topic only on the other side. So the uh, the liberals have taken their lumps today. Now that next we'll have the conservatives taking their lumps. <laughs>